Wonderful. So thank you so much, Cara, for such a lovely introduction. And it's uh, brilliant to be here today with everyone. Um, as mentioned, I'm Hazel Thornton. I work at UNEP WCMC and I'm here with my colleague, Jonti. Um, and we're really excited to be talking with IUCN CEO and all of you. So please do use the chat and write your questions in and we'll, we'll get to them later in the session. Um, so just giving a bit of a, an overview of what we're going to be talking about today. I'll um, start off by setting the scene, talking about some of the broader um, topics of restoration and the links to the funding and financial aspects. And then I'll take you on a bit of a regional focus, a dive into one of our projects, uh, mapping European funding landscape uh, for restoration. And then I'll hand over to, to Jonti, looking at blended finance, looking at the private sector and governments, um, and then concluding with some discussion on restoration in the private sector. Got a quick little summary at the end for you, and then we'd be really excited to discuss with you, hear your thoughts, discuss questions, and, and really get engaged in some discussions. So uh, really looking forward to today's session. Thanks again, Cara, for having us. Lovely. So... Ah, thanks, Chanti. Um, so we're starting off with the need for action and where we are and where, why restoration is such a hot topic and being discussed so, so globally. So 75% of degraded land globally means that ecosystem rest, uh, degradation is uh, undermining the well-being of about 3.2 billion people. And this loss of species and ecosystem services is estimated to cost 10% of the global GDP annually. Key ecosystems that deliver numerous ecosystem services, such as food, water safety, um, our supply of um, different ecosystems that protect us from hazards and provide us with habitats for species, such as fish and pollinators, are all rapidly declining. And there is a real interest and real need for green recovery in the post-COVID-19 uh, recovery, looking at how we can create green jobs through the restoration economy. And there's a big drive to understanding how this can be effective, sustainable, and how we can work this into the, the restoration of our degraded ecosystems. So there's already a really strong recognition of how much productive sectors and the economy rely on natural capital. According to the World Economic Forum 2020 Global Risks Report, biodiversity loss is ranked as one of the top five threats to humanity faced in the next 10 years. And with it being the fourth most likely and the third most impactful risk. And this has risen year on year. Um, commercial services and society in general depends on and impacts on nature, creating a risk to society and companies that are dependent uh, on natural uh, resources and the provision of their ecosystem services. So therefore, restoration is really vital to companies, to governments, to society, to ensure that they're, um, to secure their dependency on nature to mitigate impacts and to reduce the financial risk. So here we explore a number of different ways where we can um, explore funding opportunities and find mechanisms of, of financial support that work in both, both ways. The recent release of the Dasgupta Review uh, focuses on an imbalance between our demands on nature and nature's ability to supply, um, to meet our demands. We as a society are accumulating uh, produced and human capital at the expense of natural capital by prioritizing economic growth and development, um, which has led to devastating costs to nature. Our biodiversity enables the biosphere um, to be more productive, to be more resilient, to be more adaptable, to help us to reduce risks and uncertainty post proposed to society and our economy. Um, restoration itself of biodiversity is becoming more expensive than conservation. So acting now is essential to reducing the overall cost to society and the economy. Delaying action towards st stabilizing biodiversity by just 10 years would more than double the cost compared to acting right now. So businesses, government, society, when we delay our action towards the st stabilizing the biodiversity, can potentially be accumulating increased risks and increased costs in the long term compared to acting right now. So what can be achieved from restoration? 
We know a number of different uh, benefits from restoration, including the conservation of biodiversity, climate change mitigation, where nature-based solutions can provide up to 30% of the mitigation required by 2030, and increasingly productive landscapes and seascapes which support our economy, which provide us with jobs, which provide food and water security and supporting human health all have uh, a benefit to play. And there's also the economic return where the benefits of uh, restoration can ten exceed 10 times the cost of investment and cost of inaction versus inaction is uh, thought to be a third in terms of ratios. So by 2030, restoration of 350, 350 million hectares of degraded terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems could generate at 9 trillion US dollars in ecosystem services um, and also removing 13 to 26 gigatons of greenhouse gases. So restoring damaged and degraded ecosystems can help us to achieve healthy, sustained ecosystems with a broad range of benefits for people and nature. As such, restoration is a global, regional and a national priority and important private and public commitments have been made to halt, reverse and uh, prevent degradation. And countries around the world uh, and companies around the world are developing different initiatives um, to scale up action and uh, to, to generate such um, a catalyst for action. So the UN decade itself uh, does not set new targets and aims to enhance global, regional, and national commitments. And so it provides an opportunity for public and private decision makers to promote nature-based solutions, to support and provide opportunities for funding that have real tangible change on the ground to deliver the benefits that people need and require. So to support this global movement for the UN Decade, a number of task forces have been set up. The most pertinent to today's topic is the Finance Task Force, and this will be chaired by World Bank and has three main aims. Firstly, to provide guidance to reorient subsidies towards ecosystem restoration in an appropriate manner. Secondly, to counter economic forces and vested interests that result in economic degradation. And finally, to incentivize public and corporate investors to co-invest in ecosystem restoration. And these include areas where benefits from restoration are predominantly public goods. So as Cara mentioned earlier, please be sure to check back to the UN Decade websites, to all their different social medias for more information on this UN Decade um, task force on finance and to find out more about different opportunities as they come through. So in addition to the technical support from the UN Decade task forces, the UN Decade will also communicate and raise awareness about restoration around the world. And several of those support innovative financing and new funding opportunities. So the UN Decade Digital Hub will showcase activities on a very variety of different platforms where there's an increase in scale, scope and pace of restoration. But the Digital Hub will also facilitate dialogues between stakeholders and different sectors to look at ways of maximizing ecosystem restoration benefits, as well as connecting investors with restoration implementers. So a really key tool in terms of innovative financing. There is also analysis being undertaken by the Economics of Ecosystem Restoration Group, TIA, and which is a multi-partner initiative to collect standardized data about the costs and also the benefits of ecosystem restoration. Um, and looking at that from uh, the perspective of different organizations, different investors and different governments to help them in planning, uh, prioritizing, and also looking at a further analysis of ecosystem restoration as the economics of it develop and evolve. Thanks so much, John T. So now I'll just take you on to a bit of a, a, a dive into the regional funding for ecosystem restoration, uh, where we'll be taking a moment to share the findings of our, oh, just one slide back, <laughs> too quick, um, for a collaborative project between UNEP WCMC and Flora and Fauna International, which was funded by uh, the Endangered Landscape Programme, uh, in which we explored the funding landscape of ecosystem restoration. <laughs> 
So the project itself aimed to understand the landscape of funding that's been allocated to restoration specifically within Europe and it looked to inform future decision making and prioritisation. So the research has shown that funding for conservation must increase in an order of magnitude to implement existing international targets but also greater coordination of existing funding is needed at the international, regional and, and national level. So a number of reviews have been undertaken and strategies have been proposed regarding funding allocations, but we found that little was known about allocation of restoration funding. Um, and we didn't know the value, the focus, the priorities or the flows of restoration funding. So with little knowledge on what was being funded, where, how, why, we thought it was a really important time uh, before the 2030 biodiversity strategy for the EU, before the UN decade started, to really take a deep dive and look into this and look at the long term um, restoration that had occurred. So in 2019, we undertook a desk-based research project um, looking at ecosystem restoration projects from 2010 to 2020. And we looked at restoration projects um, across 51 countries and territories, um, looking at funders, beneficiaries, implementing partners, and the amount of funding that was split by co-funding and financing. We also looked at the location, um, the specific sites in the countries, the length of the project, et cetera. And it really allowed us to, to look at a broad range of projects, 412 in total, um, looking at 204 different funders, and they covered 1.6 million hectares of European landscapes, and a total of 1.2 billion uh, euros was committed to the funding those projects over that decade. And we found that 86% of the funding was allocated to terrestrial ecosystems uh, with only 11% on marine projects um, and only 11 of those 412 projects were restoring both marine and terrestrial. So when we delve down into those different findings, we found that projects were committed between 1 and 3 million euros. At nearly half of the projects, sorry, were committed nearly between one and three million euros and projects themselves ranged from 19,000 euros to 28 million euros so a huge range of projects across that that time frame across that landscape and across the different ecosystems and um, within those 200 or so uh, funders we've categorized them into a variety of we've categorized them to four different um, groupings finding that international bodies which included EU life and a number of European Commission projects were the main body of, uh, of restoration funders national governments um, coming next and private sector and philanthropic slash foundations really um, having large contributions um, to the restoration efforts within Europe. We also looked into the relationship between the funders and the type of ecosystem that was um, being the focus of restoration, um, looking at marine and terrestrial separately. Um, so you can see that in the, in the diagram underneath. They're really interesting to see uh, the different categories and the different split within those um, ecosystems. And we also um, wanted, uh, once we'd understood where the, the funding was coming from, we wanted to understand where it was going to and what sort of ecosystem restoration projects were being carried out, what they were hoping to achieve. So we looked at different benefits that the restoration projects were identifying. Um, most of them only identified one or two uh, benefits of their main project goal, even though we all know that restoration has multiple benefits for many different people, for many different um, uh, habitats, for many different species. And so we recorded these and split them down. Um, and for each one, you can see that uh, the percentage of projects and also the um, the, the percentage of funding that was received. So for example, uh, biodiversity conservation was the goal of 81% of the projects and received 79% of the project of, of the funding. Um, so it was really interesting to see this split and to understand where the funding was going to and why. I'm handing over to Jonty now who will be taking us on to blended finance, the private sector and government, and also looking into um, public and private uh, sector restoration. So handing over to Jonty. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Hazel.
So yeah, as Hazel mentioned, what I'm going to cover today is kind of a mixture of two different bits and pieces. And firstly, is around this kind of government and private sector blended finance. So essentially, you know, we can't achieve restoration solely with government funding and the private sector does need to be involved to a large degree in terms of those uh, various different initiatives that are implemented on the ground. But a lot of the time, the private sector are reluctant to do this um, because they often see it as a risky exercise. And especially in the agricultural space, you know, farming on pristine areas of land is much better than restoring back degraded areas of land and farming on those alongside additional areas of restoration. Now, when it comes to actually kind of blending those two finance streams together, both from the government and the private sector side of things, you've got this kind of ethical investment frontier. And this is very much couched around this new cohort um, of, of kind of investors that are coming up to the, the, the fore. And this is around millennials. So millennials as a cohort are now much more likely um, to invest ethically um, across a large swath um, of different investment funds. And as a result, the finance industry is actually responding to that and initialising many different new funds and facilities that are actually opening the doors to doing really innovative projects on the ground around restoration and achieving that kind of nature positive impact. So it's quite an interesting development and a lot of the companies and their investor relation teams are now starting to see that shift in the focus of those new investors um, to be a lot more disruptive but also funding more nature positive and climate positive solutions. So companies kind of need to understand um, that biodiversity kind of language and avoid misinterpretations when kind of communicating that to their investors. But this is kind of translated through into those new kind of ethical investment funds. And part and parcel of that is making sure that those funds are properly supported, but also that the, the risk that the private sector are taking when they're funding these initiatives um, is slightly offset by government supporting that. And I've got a little video which will go into this in a little bit more detail. And I'm sure there are going to be a few questions on it at the end, because for those of you that are less than uh, read into the finance side of things, it might be a bit of a deep dive, but let's, uh, let's see if it works. Did you know that on average, 7 million hectares of tropical forests disappear every year? The equivalent of 26 football fields every minute. Most of it comes from agriculture, whether from efficient, large farming businesses or low yield smallholder farmers. But in order to feed our rising population, farmers need to produce more and their most cost-effective solution is for them to deforest new terrain. However, today, nearly 40% of our land surface is already dedicated to agriculture. If this goes on, we won't tackle the climate crisis or meet the sustainable development goals. It is critical that we transition to deforestation-free agriculture but there are obstacles. First, farmers need technical knowledge to increase yields and at the same time preserve existing forests. Communities and businesses need incentives to restore degraded landscapes and they need the capacity to implement integrated agroforestry systems where crops, cattle and forest are mixed. Second, the transition also requires considerable funds which farmers need to borrow from someone but lenders and investors face costs and financial risks when financing the transition to sustainable farming. There is a need for governments, public and private finance institutions to scale up the availability of tools such as credit guarantees and junior or first loss loans. These are forms of insurance. In case the borrower cannot reimburse his loan, the lender is covered for part of his losses lowering the risk of such an investment. Grants are also needed to support smallholder farmers with training, development, and replanting, as well as monitoring the progress of businesses and communities to stop deforestation. By coordinating the appropriate government, financial, and corporate actors, you and environment and partners can trigger a transformational shift in leveraging public funding to unlock and scale up private finance flowing to saving forests, restoring landscapes, and transitioning to climate-smart agriculture.
Let's work together to make this global transformation happen. So that was just one example of kind of blended finance um, and an initiative that we're kind of pushing forwards at the moment um, and trying to implement at a landscape scale. So there are a couple of funds and facilities that have come online underneath this kind of blended finance initiative um, that are working with the private sector and government to implement those kind of, you know, sustainable farming practices on the ground, including um, restoration. And uh, there's a number of examples currently in Brazil, but we've also got uh, projects in Indonesia and uh, a larger kind of uh, fund of funds, which I'll come on to um, in my next slide. So essentially this fund of funds is called what's called the Restoration Seed Capital Facility. And what it is, is essentially a facility which funds impact investing funds. So there are a lot of good ideas out there in terms of setting up a fund which invests in you know, nature positive and biodiversity positive actions on the ground, including restoration. And those ethical investment funds are driven by those trends that I mentioned earlier. Now, in terms of actually setting those up, a lot of them are quite adventurous, they're innovative, and not always, but often that they don't get the funding they need to actually succeed. So what UNEP has done with a number of their partners is actually set up this restoration seed capital facility, which looks at actually funding funds that will look to fund restoration. So there's a long supply chain there in terms of the, the funders and, and who funds who and, and what funds what. Uh, but essentially the funds would then look to, to give out um, you know, additional funding for projects on the ground, which had a return from, from restoration or even nature based solutions, for example. So in terms of kind of why um, this restoration seed capital facility would actually be needed. So, you know, more investment in forest restoration is needed. And, and I think that's a no brainer. And, you know, the scale of the challenge of deforestation and land degradation is, is absolutely daunting. So, you know, objectives will not be met without significant investment. And this comes from both those public and private sector um, investment side of things. So, you know, with those varying different kind of, you know, global forest coverage clearance and, you know, the amount that's been degraded, um, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty daunting task. And current funding for forest landscape restoration is far below um, the, what it actually needs. And only six billion um, US dollars is actually invested in kind of mitigating and adapting um, in developed countries when it comes to forest landscape restoration. But if we were to achieve, say, you know, the New York Declaration on Forests, for example, we'd actually need, you know, 837 billion US dollars. And that is a massive, massive difference and a massive, massive scale up in terms of the level of investment that actually actually is needed in forest landscape restoration. And, you know, the restoration seed capital facility, it aims to at least help with that um, and start to move things along together from a private sector and a public sector perspective. So that's it from a kind of a blended finance side of things in terms of how both governments and the private sector can work together. And there are many other examples in that field, um, but that just kind of gives you a taste um, of, of the, the, the varying different kind of directions that they can move in. When it comes to kind of restoration and the private sector um, as a very kind of discrete um, area, um, this is driven um, largely by the move towards um, you know, the recognition of, of nature and of biodiversity loss as a material risk for business. So previously, um, nature and biodiversity was seen as very much as CSR, so corporate social responsibility and a reputational risk for business. So the private sector normally engage in it out of necessity for you know, maintaining their social license to operate and buy in from society rather than actually seeing that you know, biodiversity and nature has a material risk for their business and their businesses are dependent upon biodiversity. And this is something that's really started to come to the fore in the last five years. And Hazel mentioned that um, World Economic Forum Global Risks report earlier, and you can actually see it here on the right in terms of their four quadrant graph. Now, this graph actually looks at um, the, the impacts of business in terms of impact and likelihood of the varying different things um, that happen around the world. And this is everything from pandemic risk all the way through to, you know, climate change and, you know, regulatory risk and, and trade wars. And what we've consistently found over the last three years is that biodiversity has crept up the agenda in terms of how CEOs perceive it as a risk for their business. Now, what we're seeing now is that biodiversity is the third most severe and likely impact 
on businesses and the, the, the also the third most in terms of environmental risk. So environmental risk as a, as a kind of category, they are now seen as the three top risks for business um, across uh, those suite of CEOs which were surveyed as part of this World Economic Forum um, you know, Global Risks Report. And the business case for private sector engagement in conservation is now kind of evolving out of that kind of CSR argument. And businesses are already now starting to see that they need to really care about biodiversity and nature in their decision making processes. And they need to start to reverse that biodiversity loss and that, that biodiversity decline. And in terms of actually how this relates to business, it's, it, it translates into multiple risks across multiple sectors. And you can see this here from the World Economic Forum Nature Risk Rising Report. And this ultimately translates into $44 trillion of business risk, so 50% of global GDP. And you can see the varying different sectors and how that kind of risk is disaggregated across multiple sectors. And of course, you know, if you're going to alleviate this risk and if you are going to you know, support businesses' dependency upon biodiversity, you need to start to restore back some of that biodiversity and some of that nature or that natural capital that we have lost over the last 50 years. And to do that, restoration is going to be absolutely fundamental. Now, I mentioned the private sector earlier. And in terms of how you know, nature and the private sector are now perceived, um, they're included in what's called environmental, social and governance safeguards or frameworks. Now, ESG for short is what's driving um, at least part of this recognition uh, within the private sector of how they are dependent upon nature. And if you're ever going to engage with the private sector in terms of implementing innovative restoration initiatives and bending that curve of biodiversity loss, understanding how to communicate those those impacts and dependencies of the private sector upon nature is key and one of those tools is ESG issues. Now the MSCI Emerging Markets Index is essentially an index which looks at those companies with integrated ESG safeguards and those environmental, social and governance safeguards under that environmental component, biodiversity and restoration is a core constituent part. Now, what they've been saying is that this MS MSCI Emerging Markets Index has actually tracked those companies with those integrated safeguards against those companies without those integrated safeguards. And what we can see is since 2008 and the, the economic recession that happened there, that those companies with those integrated ESG safeguards have actually been able to weather recessions and economic shocks much more than those companies without ESG safeguards. And there's actually proof now that those companies with integrated ESG safeguards have an increased valuation and profitability against those companies which don't. And you can actually see the difference in those two lines on that, that graph in the bottom left there in terms of those companies that actually have those integrated ESG safeguards performing much, much better against those companies without those ESG um, um, safeguards in place. So ESG is now that key part of analysts' work so that companies need to ensure that they are acting and reporting in biodiversity because as it underpins that E in ESG. So addressing that biodiversity crisis is now frequently seen as the next big thing after climate for the private sector. And as such, it's important to start understanding that language for the private sector when it comes to biodiversity, restoration and nature as a whole. So I kind of mentioned bending the curve of biodiversity loss and you know, so achieving that net positive outlook um, for the private sector and action on biodiversity and, and why we need to bend that curve on biodiversity loss is fundamental. And to do that, you know, companies are going to have to have that nature positive outcome and restoration is absolutely key to achieving that. Now, you know, in terms of actually understanding what this means for the private sector, you know, quite frequently, you know, restoration and bending the curve of biodiversity loss um, is, you know, entirely dependent upon those industries and those sectors that have site based impact. And these are often extractive sectors, whether that's agriculture and those extracting biomass, or whether that's the mining sector, whether that's the energy sector. Essentially, it's going to be those that actually have impacts on the ground and therefore need to restore back the impact that they've had on their areas of, of their land takes or their operational land holdings. And that's where restoration plays a core part in kind of building back and, and restoring and bending that curve of biodiversity loss. So the main tool in the arsenal um, of many companies in terms of understanding restoration and how it kind of slots into their business model is going to be around the mitigation hierarchy. 
Now, this is a, a sequential series of steps aimed to minimize the negative impacts of biodiversity and achieve what's known as no net loss um, in biodiversity or even net gain in biodiversity. Now, the question becomes how, you know, how does the private sector engage in biodiversity conservation? And the mitigation hierarchy has been a pivotal tool in addressing this. So here we have that visual representation of the mitigation hierarchy and the concept of which are applicable among many different sectors. And essentially what it does is you move, so you know, companies when they're operating in a certain landscape, when they begin those operations, they predict their impact. And after they've predicted their impact, they look to avoid as much of that impact as they possibly can. And that's the first stage of the mitigation hierarchy, avoidance. Then after they've avoided as much impact as they possibly can, they look to minimize that impact through doing certain measures such as, you know, subduing light pollution and noise pollution and damping down so that, you know, dust pollution isn't an issue for, for you know, for the area. And after they've done that minimization of impacts, they then look to restore as much of those impacts as they possibly can within the landscape. And this is where restoration is absolutely fundamental. And restoration in its own right at this stage in the mitigation hierarchy can achieve no net loss if implemented appropriately and effectively. And this is where that intersect between you know, conservation, trusts and foundations, government and the private sector really comes into play. Because of course, that restoration side of things is not just driven in silo by the private sector, but it is actually driven through a multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder driven approach. And a lot of the innovative work that you know, people are doing and academics are doing in the restoration space is tied in by the private sector in restoring back some of that impact that they've had. And, you know, we've all got smartphones, you know, mining is needed to underpin the energy transition. So it's needed to kind of move away from oil and gas towards a more sustainable future. So at the end of the day, you know, these site based impacts that are you know, driven by the private sector are going to be needed to some degree for the foreseeable future as we move towards a more sustainable future. So what we need to do is make sure the restoration being implemented in these initiatives is, you know, the most sound science it can be, and that there is that level of engagement with the private sector to ensure that the restoration is on point and scientifically robust. And the mitigation hierarchy is a key tool in implementing that. On the flip side, however, we also have, you know, the opportunities um, around engaging with the private sector. And, you know, the private sector is driven, you know, in part by return on investment. So if they are going to invest a certain amount of funds in area X, can they get a higher return on investment by aligning that investment with something else? And at the moment, quite a lot of kind of clamor in this space is around co-benefits. And that's aligning things like, you know, biodiversity restoration initiatives or landscape scale restoration initiatives with other types of initiatives like sustainable livelihood generation or increasing climate resilience in their operations. So a key example would be a project that I worked on in uh, East Africa. And this very much looked at, you know, the plantation of a mangrove uh, on, on the coastline. And what this mangrove did was it actually looked at, you know, it was a biodiversity restoration initiative, but it also had sustainable livelihood generation potential because of the fisheries that spawn off the back of the restoration of that mangrove. But it also had the added benefit of actually increasing or rather decreasing the climate resilience um, on the uh, onshore operations of the actual company themselves. So they had off, uh, onshore operations, they also had offshore operations. And, you know, in planting that mangrove, it decreased the wave action and the potential for storm surges to actually affect um, the onshore operations. So therefore increasing the resilience of those onshore operations. And you can see just by combining those various different co-benefits in that landscape through that restoration initiative, um, you know, the company was much, much more kind of beneficial and much more inclined to fund that restoration initiative because it had those multiple benefits for their operations but also the landscape and their sustainability reporting as a whole. Another kind of frontier in this space and I did kind of mention this very briefly is around the energy transition and responsible sourcing. So while I have mentioned you know those companies who are looking to kind of implement restoration of the landscape scale so those companies with direct site-based impact there are also those companies further down the supply chain. So you know the Microsofts, the Intels of the world who actually have components that go into their you know computers into their various different products. Yeah. <laughs> 
And those products are now being looked at by those ethical investment funds, by the finance industry as a whole. And these companies are now trying to prove and trying to say that the commodities, so the metals, the minerals, the varying different constituent parts of their products that they have sourced have been responsibly sourced. So there is also a drive from the other side of the equation, so from the supply chain side of things. And one of the key examples here is the energy transition. So as we move towards a carbon free future and increase the amount of renewables globally, there is going to have to be a massive increase in global mining to support the demand for minerals and metals that will go into these renewables. So in some cases, this is actually going to have to be increased by a thousand percent. So you can see that kind of figure there on the right from the World Bank. And you know, when we have 1000% increases in the need for some commodities to underpin the energy transition, there is going to be a global increase in mining extraction. And when that is done, it needs to be done responsibly. And that includes the restoration and rehabilitation of those mine sites. So this is yet another aspect or another facet in the ability to involve restoration and kind of bridge that gap between the private sector and the level of innovative kind of restoration projects and kind of thinking that's currently going on within the academic sector and the NGO space. So there is going to be an increased demand within the energy sector as they transition towards renewables and within the mining sector as they kind of expand the extraction of those metals and minerals that will underpin the energy transition and within the finance sector to understand how these minerals and metals are being responsibly sourced. So all of these kind of perfect storm brings together the need for restoration and kind of bending that curve of biodiversity loss and how key it will be um, when it comes to actually building back or restoring back and rehabilitating back these landscapes as they help to transform the global economy and the global kind of societal change that we need um, to, to kind of move away from um, this kind of carbon dependent economy that we're currently uh, existing in today. So that's it in terms of how to engage with the private sector and how also governments and the private sector can engage in tandem when it comes to implementing restoration initiatives. And I hope that I've touched upon some interesting themes there, which will potentially help you engage with the private sector and engage with governments when it comes to implementing innovative restoration initiatives in the future. Um, and I'm just going to pass over back to Hazel now for in summary um, for her part, and then I'll also um, just quickly dive back in there towards the end. Thanks so much, John T. Thank you for that um, brilliant stuff on private sector engagement and the restoration um, uh, sort of work and how we can get engaged. So yeah, just giving you a quick summary as we um, before we head into some of the discussions. And it's really clear um, as we move into the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, more and more people around the world are becoming aware of the urgency and the need for restoration, the benefits that restoration can deliver. And we need to ensure that the funding mechanisms and the funding that is provided is effective, is efficient and is sustainable. And so that we can fund long term process that is restoration. And there are a number of different opportunities that just reflecting upon about some of the work that we've done recently. And one of the ways is to communicate the benefits of restoration better and to communicate to wider audiences outside of those who are restoration literate, such as ourselves. Um, so, for example, in our project um, looking at European restoration funding, we found that there was 1.2 billion euros allocated to 412 projects across Europe over the last decade. But when you look at statistics about the value of the ecosystem services within Europe, they're estimated at one point, uh, they're estimated at 125 billion a year. So there's a discrepancy in terms of the, um, the, the funding placed in and the value uh, return and making sure that restoration is a high return investment and such numbers can speak to those potentially who are um, not so restoration literate, but are more familiar with economies and the ways in which sectors of those drive forward. We can also communicate to wider audiences within the restoration world. If practitioners, if managers, if um, implementers are able to communicate their work as a mean to achieving multiple goals, um, we can potentially open up new opportunities for funding, looking at different funders who are funding different opportunities for climate mitigation or biodiversity, looking at fresh water, looking at health benefits, looking at different funding opportunities that tap into different benefits and, and showcasing that restoration is a means to delivering that. 
We can also look at past funding to reflect on future biases and therefore where we can address. Um, we saw that there's quite a big um, emphasis on terrestrial and freshwater ecosystem restoration and increasingly marine is coming through, um, looking at different um, regions, different um, ecosystems, looking at different mechanisms for restoration. And so comparing those and making sure that we're um, restoring the world collaboratively um, and increasing focus on different ecosystems around the world. Our fundings can also stimulate discussions about the frameworks around our restoration. So looking at the length of a project versus the restoration pro uh, process, we are aware that restoration is a long-term process, yet still funding is often provided for the time taken to carry out the restoration activities and not necessarily for the longer term monitoring over the following years, decades, half a, you know, up to centuries. And so establishing frameworks that sustainable funding can, can act can be accessed for restoration throughout the process of restoration uh, could be a, a huge new opportunity. And uh, finally, looking at the increasing needs and opportunities for funding mechanisms to span across ecosystems, across jurisdictions, um, and supporting landscape or seascape restoration efforts. So combining funding mechanisms, um, different countries, companies, groupings, initiatives, researchers working together across different countries can offer new opportunities for identifying uh, funding opportunities and also catalyzing um, greater funding options. So meeting the increased scale, scope and pace that we need for the UN decade and meeting the, the global targets could be a great way of, of moving forward and making um, huge change more effectively. Thanks very much. I'll hand back to, to Jonti for his concluding remarks. Thanks, Hazel. Yeah, so, so in close, you know, the, the period from, from 2021 to 2030, uh, it presents an opportunity for kind of businesses and for, you know, academics and, you know, the, the, the larger kind of CSO sector to take leadership in delivering kind of sustainable development and reversing that biodiversity loss and biodiversity decline through restoration. So, you know, biodiversity is in decline and over half the world's GDP is potentially at risk due to the dependence of business on biodiversity and ecosystem services. And communicating this and ensuring that business understands their dependence on biodiversity is absolutely fundamental, but also presents a great opportunity to engage with businesses on innovative restoration projects that will help stem and reverse this biodiversity decline. Nature can be conserved, restored and used sustainably if we take urgent and concerted action. And this is going to become from multiple sections of society. So national governments, companies, business and from academ academia and from CSOs and NGOs. This requires transformative change of major socio-economic systems. If key transitions can be achieved within these systems, not only will we respond to these threats, but we will create significant business value and significant value for society. I mean, an example from the World Economic Forum was that if we act appropriately and if we act align nature and business together, including restoration, this can actually generate 400 million jobs by 2030. And the, the potential benefits for society as a whole from restoring back this degradation and pull down on natural capital that we have seen over the last 50 years is insurmountable. And it will become the new frontier of investment as we move forward. So key transitions can be achieved within these systems. And not only will we respond to the threats to biodiversity, but we will create that significant societal value. And systemic change can only be succeeded if we work together. And that's where bridging this gap between governments, the private sector and the wider kind of restoration community is absolutely pivotal. And I hope that our, uh, our presentation today has just given you some food for thought um, with that and maybe kind of precipitates those conversations, maybe catalyzes things as you move forward into this kind of UN decade on restoration and as we really start to bend the curve in biodiversity loss. Uh, but I thank you for, for listening today and uh, we'll certainly kind of open the floor to, for, to questions now. So over to you, Cara. Thank you so much for that journey and overview of finance and restoration. It's a topic that we have not covered yet in the series and is obviously so important. So this was really a huge contribution. I learned a ton about the resources that are out there. 
We do have quite a few questions to go through. Um, I asked Jonti and Hazel if they could stick around a little past the hour so we had more time to discuss and they agreed. So if you do need to drop off at the hour, please do so. But if you want to stick around, you can continue adding questions into the chat. I'll do a plug for the June webinar is uh, going to be on, does restoration need to be multilingual? And we have Robert Kenwood who will be joining us and he's in the lead, on the leadership team for IUCN CEM. That should be really interesting. Please do join us in June. Add your questions into the Q&A. There were a few questions that came into the chat. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind, put them over in the Q&A or I won't see them to ask them. And then I did share some links too about the videos. Okay, so we had uh, questions related to where to find resources and then also questions related to what we really know about restoration and economic benefits. So I'm going to start there with the latter. And Jaskar asked, what evidence is there for restoration leading to livelihood improvement for local people? And then he shared some experience with forest landscape restoration in Cameroon and that land governance is not helping a lot in the process. All actions are mostly against community livelihood. So how can we make these links between policy, sustainability, and what happens to local people? I think that one may have been aimed at me. <laughs> So I'll, I'll take that. Um, but essentially, I mean, livelihoods are absolutely pivotal. And unless you um, ensure that sustainable livelihood generation is part and parcel of any restoration project or any wider landscape initiative, you're not going to get sufficient stakeholder buy-in engagement. And you can actually have adverse impacts at the end of the day. And we have seen this in, in, in numerous cases with what are called your indirect and induced impacts, whereby you have a project move to an area, there's potential for jobs, you end up with a population increase, the jobs aren't there. So then that population tends to actually engage in more destructive activities like deforestation or bushmeat hunting, which then has negative knock-on impacts um, for biodiversity. In terms of you know, the specific examples that we use today, so from the land use finance space, one of the, the key things that we've done is we've had these suite of KPIs. And I mentioned the KPIs that were very much attached to you know, forest landscape restoration and biodiversity. But there are another whole suite of KPIs that are driven around kind of gender balance and sustainable livelihood generation. And ensuring that you know, there is gender balance on the projects that are opened. And that also there are a number of livelihoods generated for the, 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 the kind of local population. I've also worked on a couple of other projects um, and we have worked with, with a couple of private sector partners who have been implementing projects around Red Plus and co-benefits from a Red Plus perspective when it came to restoration, um, but actually looking at making sure that those Red Plus initiatives had a sustainable livelihood component to them, whereby the local population were engaged to actually kind of act as forest stewards and maintain those landscapes and actually generate um, carbon credits, which then supported them from a sustainable livelihoods perspective, and then sell those credits back to the varying different companies that were involved. Um, and we've seen multiple examples with successful Red Plus projects like this um, in Liberia and Sierra Leone as well. One of the key things that kind of denotes whether these projects are successful and whether you have that you know, proper engagement in sustainable livelihoods, but not only sustainable livelihoods, but restoration and kind of forest landscape restoration as a whole, is making sure that the environments where you operate are enabling as opposed to disabling. And there are multiple national level governments across the world that have nature-based solutions, that have co-benefits, that have restoration clearly written into their regulatory standards and there is clear buy-in. But there is nothing more disheartening than starting a restoration project and having it promptly sold for mineral rights or resource extraction. And that frequently happens in those landscapes where there is not an enabling environment present. And that is something that you should really take into consideration when looking to implement these initiatives. And I know it's obviously a, a difficult pill to swallow if there is a, a really core area of forest that is just you know, so pivotal on a landscape connectivity perspective. Um, but it's still something worth taking into account. Um, because at the end of the day, if we're investing millions in a restoration project that is destined to fail because of you know, a, a disabling environment, um, that money could have been invested better elsewhere and maybe had more of a scalable impact. 
Um, and I'll just kind of pitch one last thing because I did see a couple of questions in there on climate change. And that's just around the fact that, you know, as we do move through to this 1.5 degree temperature rise and this new kind of, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, or maybe a new epoch um, of humanity, um, we do have to make sure that those, those climate, um, uh, you know, restoration uh, things that we, we implement are climate resilient and that those restoration initiatives are resilient to that 1.5 degree increase in temperature. And that's just something else to bear in mind when you are costing out those initiatives, but also pitching them to the private sector and to governments as a whole, who are very, very cognizant of this as an issue at the moment. Thank you so much for those comments. That really links to a question that Diana asked about why investments in ecological restoration projects that are focused on uh, climate change mitigation are so low. Um, you showed data that they were 8% of overall investments. Yes, um, I mean that, that that does tie into it to some degree. Um, so it's those enabling versus disabling landscapes and it's also just the fact that you know restoration projects are, are, are difficult to sell at points, um, especially from the climate change mitigation and adaptation perspective. It's much easier to buy uh, pre-existing forest from an offset perspective. So there is a, an increased drive now um, from a government perspective, but also in the private sector to actually purchase vast swaths of forest and actually have them as a carbon offset as opposed to restoring back areas of forest, um, which can be you know, a really interesting area um, of carbon sequestration, you know, mitigation and, and adaptation. Um, hopefully over the next decade with, with the UN decade and with this kind of push from, from UNEP in the sustainable land use finance space and these kind of, you know, restoration seed capital facility, we are going to start to reverse that trend. Um, but it's largely around kind of risk profiles and just the fact that, you know, it's seen as a less risky investment to buy pre-existing areas of forest. Mm -hmm. So Celia asked a question along those lines. It's clear we need to significantly ramp up availability of funding for restoration to you know, achieve all of these societal goals. To what extent do you think the private sector can actually help fill this funding gap? And really the, the meat of her question is, do we need new funding sources or do we need to redirect existing financial resources? For example, by removing perverse subsidies or redirecting public and private funds towards restoration. It's a very tricky question. Thank you for that. Uh, put me on the spot there. So I think personally, um, I, I would say redirecting um, is the way to go. I mean, certainly there are kind of rumblings in the CBD process and a number of other um, different kind of policy legislation out there, um, which is around kind of reversing these damaging subsidies um, and making sure that, that that isn't part and parcel of the economic model that we move towards. Um, when I talked about that transformative and systemic change at the end of the presentation there. You know, when it comes to actually kind of implementing these restoration initiatives, um, having that, that private sector capital redirected in the appropriate form is going to be absolutely key. And, you know, I mentioned natural capital at multiple points in my presentation, and we've had this drawdown on natural capital, and this links through to Hazel's points on the Das Gupta review, which I would certainly recommend you read. And we've had this drawdown on natural capital for the past 50 years at the behest of increasing, you know, global productivity. Now, you know, we've all got smartphones, there's plans obsolescence in multiple different products globally, and that's all at the behest of nature, or all, sorry, all at the cost of nature. And, you know, we have to reverse that trend. And to do that, we need to start to redirect those financial flows. And we are starting to see indications that that is happening through both the, the, the kind of implementation of those ethical investment funds that I mentioned, but also the, the drives in this disruptive finance. So there are multiple different disruptive financiers out there which have bought shares in, in various different companies which attend annual meetings and have, you know, voted down accounts. Um, just because of lackluster commitments to climate change and to biodiversity. And it's initiatives like this, and it's, you know, it's being disruptive, it's being innovative, and it's pushing the private sector in ways that they haven't ordinarily moved in, that is pushing that kind of redirecting um, kind of the, the financial flows towards you know, issues like restoration. But that in conjunction with the private sector realizing that, that at the end of the day, they're actually dependent upon nature to function, that's actually moving them towards redirecting those financial flows themselves at the same time. Um, so it's kind of those, those two different forces that are 
forcing governments and the private sector to reassess their relationship with nature. And we are seeing it as a major force on the horizon. Um, and I think it's only a couple of years behind climate change. And the amount of kind of, you know, further that we're seeing around climate change at the moment, I think is where biodiversity and nature and restoration is going to be in a couple of years time um, with an increasing dependence upon reporting and making sure that companies meet their targets on biodiversity and nature, which is going to be a very, very interesting move. Yeah, for sure. So one more question, I think for you, Jonti, and then I'm, I'm going to switch to some of the data sources and Hazel, I think you'll be in the hot seat. Anup, so you were, Jonti, you were talking about uh, natural capital and Anup asked very early on in the presentation about the extent to which valuation from ecosystem services can be utilized as a funding option after compensating the value within the community. Are there examples of this? There are examples of, of the quantification of nature. And the use of that in kind of making the argument for, you know, why companies should care. I mean, the natural capital protocol is probably one of the, the, the best examples, and they've got many case studies there um, in their literature, um, and also NCFA. And I would also recommend um, checking out Encore, which is uh, an initiative led by UNEP WCMC, which actually looked at those impacts and dependencies of the private sector upon nature and the various different exposures to certain sectors um, for, from nature as a whole. So, you know, those are a, a kind of a couple of key examples there, but in terms of the actual quantification of biodiversity, of nature, of natural capital, um, it's an ever evolving question. Um, there's certainly the, the task force on nature related financial disclosure, um, which is certainly grappling with that question at the moment. Um, and there's some interesting learnings coming out of that space. And we also actually within UNEP WCMC have a, a project which has come online now called Align. And that's all around actually aligning different kind of biodiversity measures for um, business. And it's, you know, there, there are many, many different metrics out there. And, you know, at the end of the day, the private sector wants a single number, which tells you whether they are doing good biodiversity or bad biodiversity. Mm -hmm. That's never going to happen. You know, biodiversity is, as we all know, inherently complex and a very, very deep subject. Um, but nevertheless, we are trying to make moves in that kind of area towards quantifying biodiversity into a series of metrics or, you know, a number of different kind of areas where you can actually start to look and assess your impact on biodiversity and compare those against the competitors in the same space um, or against, you know, other actors in financial markets. And that should also help, um, you know, redirect those financial flows and actually make those arguments for opening up financing towards kind of restoration um, more kind of cogently and, and, and comprehensively. Interesting. So Diana had asked which is the best methodology to measure the effectiveness of ecological restoration in terms of finance value and I'll kind of morph that question into has someone done a synthesis of the different methodologies that are being used for that? I think there are syntheses within different sectors. Um, so certainly it is going to be sector dependent, um, at least from a private sector perspective in terms of those restoration activities that are successful and do work. Um, certainly when I mentioned the energy transition, the World Bank did a brilliant um, study uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and, you know, I'm selflessly pitching my own work here because I was an author of that study. Um, but it was looking around, you know, forest smart mining. And it was looking at, you know, ways in which the uh, mining sector can actually implement um, techniques which make sure that their, you know, responsible sourcing is actually, you know, true and it is responsibly sourced in light of the energy transition. And that's just kind of one example of a study which did a, a kind of a synthesis of those different restoration techniques currently implemented by the mining sector and how successful they are. Um, but those restoration techniques are going to be diversely different for the agriculture sector um, and for, you know, say the energy sector as well. And many other sectors that have, you know, those site-based impacts such as infrastructure, for example. Um, but I, I don't know whether anyone's done a, a comprehensive overview um, of restoration techniques and uh, yeah. how effective they've been on a private sector scale. Right. I was actually thinking more of an overview of the methods of the valuation of the restoration techniques rather because yeah. that would be really interesting to see yeah. but i want to move on to since we only have a couple minutes left um there were a few questions specific about the projects and the data so linda asked hazel how did you source the data for the eu project summary that seems a feat i'm interested in the project sizes too do you have that 
where can people get information? And then Damis asked, who are the funders for Africa? And, and just more broadly, where can people find information by country on funders? So you all provided a lot of information. Any comments on how webinar part, uh, participants could access some of this information? Um, yeah, thanks so much for the comments and the questions. Uh, thank you, Linda, for, for, for the comment on the feet of it. It was uh, quite an in-depth exploration of a lot of different resources. So we had quite a bit of a team here at UNEP WCMC um, with FFI and, as I mentioned, with the Endangered Landscape Programme, um, who are also based in Cambridge. So we went onto a number of different resources, websites, and we reached out to a number of our contacts. I think we originally had a database that we pulled together of about 700 different projects. We wanted to make sure that they fitted our criteria of restoration within a certain decade, certain time frame. So you can go onto restorationfunders.com and you can explore all of the 412 projects. You can look at all their details. They're all um, details that were available online. And then we did... Um, uh, a series of different analyses on those data so making sure that we categorized them making sure that we were doing face value of what the reports what the projects what the websites um uh, reported so it was quite a, an undertaking but that meant that we could do such in-depth analysis as we showed and there's quite a lot more on the report and on the website that you can explore as well that's for european com uh, countries so we did 51 countries um and it's definitely a methodology that we can expand expand or extend to different ecosystems or uh, different countries around the world um, on your mention of uh, who are the African funders, um, I know a number of colleagues have looked into restoration efforts within Africa, and so we have a few databases on that, but within the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, there's increasing efforts to map current and existing projects, so then you can pull out all this information and looking forward as well. So I think there'll be a huge amount of resources on that digital hub with the UN Decade um, and uh, coming forward. There's also uh, analysis coming forward from the International Coral Reef Initiative. Um, on restoration for, for coral reefs and we in 2018 did an assessment of coral reef funders so um, it was great to sort of continue on that work so yeah if you check out the email the, the website restorationfunders.com you can explore that um, and happy to speak with anyone else who would be interested in expanding such resources to another country or things like that if it'd be of, of interest. We're right at 10 after the hour, so I'm going to cut off the discussion. We had many more interesting questions and comments in the Q&A than we could get to. Uh, you all made comments about the decade, and I think it's really encouraging all of the activities and syntheses and information that's being pulled together within the framework of the decade. It's really going to help us move forward in a much more evidence-based and proactive way. And the launch of the decade is right around the corner. So I'd encourage everyone to um, participate in the launch events. You can go to the, just Google the UN decade and get, you'll get to the website and you can see what's happening and look for resources there. Hopefully we will see many of you in June. Um, third Friday of every month is the webinar series. Have a safe, happy, and productive month. And thank you so much, Jonti and Hazel, for a really fantastic presentation. So thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Cara, again, for your invitation. <laughs>